Well, good morning, everybody. All right, we're going to continue our series that we started at the beginning of the year, going all the way from the front cover to, of the Bible to the back. We're calling it One Story because it's really one story with many, many episodes on the inside as we go from front to back. And uh, we've covered the entire Old Testament. We're a couple weeks into the New Testament. We're looking at the Gospels, the story, the life, the ministry of Jesus. And let me, uh, let me start this way. <clears throat> Have you ever had a time when you felt like you were the last person to know something? You ever feel like you were just late to the game and everybody else has clued in and you have not? Uh, well, I remember clocking into um, the restaurant where I worked in 1986. Uh, one Monday afternoon, I clocked in there and I remember walking in and everyone is all somber. And usually it's a real joke around kind of atmosphere. So I remember going to my friend Alan there. I said, what's the deal, Alan? You look like you just ate a bad burrito or something. And he looked at me and I felt like an absolute idiot when, when he said, you, you don't know? The space shuttle, the Challenger blew up today. Everybody died, they're all dead. And I had no, somehow I missed it. It happened six hours earlier. I had no idea. Every, I was clueless. Everybody else knew. I knew nothing. That kind of thing ha just happens sometimes. Maybe you're out of pocket all day and you come back and some big deal has changed. Or maybe, you know, it's just that you were slow to clue in on something. But that kind of stuff happens. We get out of the loop. Well, I'm going to tell you about two people in the Bible that were late in getting it. And it happened on what might be the most significant day of human history, but it happened later on that day. Um, earlier that Sunday, women had gone to the tomb of Jesus and they found it empty. And they talked about an angelic visitation and they went to go tell all the disciples and the rest is history and it's fairly well known <laughs> what happened that day. But what we're gonna look at is a lesser known episode that happened on that very same weekend and it comes out of the Gospel of Luke. And it doesn't come at the beginning of the day, because, uh, and it comes, it comes at the end. Because sometimes hope comes to you early, but not always. Sometimes hope comes late, and a lot later than we wish. So we're going to look at uh, the, the first part of this in Luke chapter 24. Here's what it says. That same day that all this had happened with the tomb of Jesus, that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, these are two of the members of that little community of people that had been following Jesus. And we find out in a moment that one of them's name is Cleopas. In the Gospel of John, we read that one of the women at the cross was named Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Now, it's likely that these two people on the road to Emmaus was actually this husband and wife that were walking along, Cleopas and Mary. And as they're discussing this, as they walk, they're trying to come to grips with all that has happened this crazy weekend. Now, while they're doing that, a stranger walks up and joins them on the road. And Luke uh, describes it with this intriguing phrase. He says, they were kept from recognizing him. They were kept from recognizing him. Now, we, the readers, know exactly who this is. It's Jesus. But they don't. For some reason, they can't recognize him. They don't. God makes it so. So they are in the dark about this. Now, for some time, this stranger just walks alongside them there. But eventually, he speaks up. And he asks them, what were you discussing as you walk along? And the question kind of stuns them. It kind of stops them in their tracks. And here's what it says, uh, how it records that in verse 18. It says, they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Okay, I'll just ask, where would you rate that question on the politeness meter? I mean, it's kind of like saying, what are you, living under a rock? How could you not know what's happened? Everybody knows what's happened here. Well, that, at that point, the stranger could have gotten off a pretty good zinger if he, if he wanted to. Well, yes, I actually have heard of Jesus. I am Jesus, duh. Could have said that, chooses not to say that. Instead, this is what he says in verse 19. He says, what things? The, the things you're talking about, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. 
He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Now look at this last phrase here. But we had hoped. But we had hoped he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. So they are, they're telling their story to Jesus, this stranger that's walking with them. They're telling their story. Everybody's got a story. You've got a story. I've got a story. At the heart of their story are these poignant words. We had hoped. Say those words with me. We had hoped. One more time. We had hoped. If you live long enough, those words become a part of your story, don't they? We had hoped to raise a great family, but then the doctor said. We had hoped that this great lifelong vision would come to fulfillment, but then I lost my job. I had hoped that I'd be free of this habit by now, but I just can't seem to shake it. I'd been hoping and hoping and hoping, but then he told me he doesn't love me. We had been hoping and praying and hoping and praying, but then our son or daughter went down a road we never thought they would ever go down. That's what this couple is saying. We had hoped. We'd been hoping that he was the one who was going to redeem us. He was going to make our story turn out okay, and now we're just not so sure. Now, we need to know something about their story because it relates to our story and your story. They were a part of a very special people, called people, called Israel, and they had a destiny. They had a calling. Their lives were not just about themselves. They're supposed to be the representatives of God's hope on earth. But their story had gone all wrong. It had gone all wrong. There was no glory in Israel, just suffering, it seemed. Way back at the beginning, they were in Egypt, in slavery. And then it just seemed after they were freed, it was just one oppressor after another. Syria, then Babylon, then the Persians, and then finally Rome. It was a story that was in search of a good ending. And then Jesus comes along. And everything seems to change. He said things that nobody ever said. He did things that nobody had ever done. And they thought maybe he would set the story right, that he would lead sort of a revolution and overthrow oppression and overthrow the enemy and make their nation prosperous and great so all the world would know that Israel's God was the king of the world. They had all these hopes. And it all seemed to be going so well with Jesus, but then everything just kind of goes south. And then Jesus ends up on a cross Now, you've got to understand why they were so dejected. Because we look at this from the other side. You have to look at this from their viewpoint. Put yourself in their place. It's not just that Jesus died, that he was put on a cross. He died on a cross. Crucifixion was what Rome did to people who thought they might be something. This is their way of saying, you thought he's Messiah, you thought he's something special, look at him up on that cross. He's not. And now Jesus is gone gone. And then they go on to say, because remember, this has been a weird weekend, they go on to say to the stranger, even today there's been these strange reports. The women went to the tomb and they said his body isn't there. And they talked about seeing an angel and stuff like that. Everything's going crazy. We don't know what's going on. So we're going to go home and we're just figure it out from there. And then the stranger speaks to them and says, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe. Why does he say that? That's not real polite. But he's not. Jesus is not insulting them here. And you know this. Everybody has had this experience. You think you know what's going on. You think you understand the story you're in. And then one moment, in a moment of blinding clarity, you find out you didn't understand it at all. You thought one thing, but the truth was another thing altogether. Probably all of us here have experienced that. I read this story recently. There was a a man and a woman that had been married for 60 years, 60 years, and they shared everything. They didn't have secrets from from each other at all, except the little old woman had a shoebox that she kept in the top of her closet, and she had told her husband never to open it and never even to discuss it. And so all those years, he never even really thought about that little shoebox. But one day that little old woman got sick, and the doctor said that she was not going to recover. And so in order to sort out their affairs, the husband went and pulled the box down from the top of the closet, and he didn't open it. He just took it to his wife's bedside and said, here it is. And she agreed. It was time for him to know all about the contents. So he opened it up, and he finds in there a stack of money, a lot of money, 
$95,000 is in the box, and two little crocheted dolls. And he asks her about the dolls, and she says, before we were married, my grandmother told me that the secret to a happy marriage was to deal with anger properly. And she told me whenever I got angry with you, I should just keep my mouth shut and crochet a doll. And this old guy was so moved, he was almost, he had to fight back tears. He's thinking, two bumps in 60 years of marriage. He was more in love with this woman than he had ever been in his entire life. And he says, oh, honey, that is beautiful. And that explains the dolls, but what, a, what about all the money? How do you explain all the money? She says, oh, that. Every time I crocheted a doll, I sold it at a craft fair for $5. <laughs> well, that's, that's the human condition. You think you know your story. You don't always know your story. One day you wake up, and some people have had this, I feel like I'm living someone else's life. I'm in someone else's story. I'm walking down a road, a road I never, ever thought that I would be on. So what happens when you realize you're getting your own story wrong? Because the life that you lead will flow out of the story that you believe that you're living. And every story is looking for an ending. So this couple walking down the Emmaus Road, they had a story, but this stranger says to them, you don't, you don't get it yet. You don't know the complete story, and you're confused because you don't see it fully. So let me explain it to you. And in verse 25, it says these words, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ, and that's his title, not his name. The Christ means the, the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one. That's what he's talking about. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. Because it's all one story, isn't it? Wouldn't you love to have been there for that conversation on the road? He says, let me tell you your story a little bit differently, the stranger says. There's a picture in there that almost nobody sees because it comes directly from the heart of God. Because the story that the Bible tells is a story of suffering as old as our world, as old as sin, and as painful as death. And not just, not just suffering, but joy that comes out of suffering. And at the heart of the story, the primary character is this suffering and yet joyful God upon whom falls the weight of a broken world because the world has gone all wrong. We all know that. The Bible says that at the core of it is this problem called sin. So God chooses this one people, this group of people, Israel, and he says, I want to have a group of people who come to know me and understand me, and they know what I want for a human life. Like, really, they understand that. And so God sends people that he called prophets to our world to paint this picture of shalom, which we interpret that word as the word peace, and that is fine, but it's incomplete. Shalom really is the way this world would be if it were not held at the throat by sin. Life without greed or hate or oppression, where things are the way God wants them to be, and Israel would be the vehicle for this expression of shalom. It's a beautiful word. And because human beings are all kind of wired up this way, they figured what that meant was that God would be vindicated when God's people were great, like all the other nations define greatness. Like this is how the people thought in the ancient world, because each nation kind of had their God or their gods, and they all figured if the nation went great, then that would prove that their God is the God of all and he was the greatest and, and all that. And we like, human beings like greatness, and we like to be associated with greatness, don't we? We all understand this. We get it. This is the story of our world. You've heard people talk like this. They say, when you make it to the top, when you really succeed, that will vindicate your story. And some of you think like that. I've been trying to do this, been trying to do this. And when I achieve this, that will vindicate my story, my life, my efforts, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, Israel would have no experience of that. So much suffering. Their people suffered from slavery in Egypt, and then it looks like they get free, but then they find that they're really in bondage to internal sin. And then they're conquered by other foes, like the Philistines and the Assyrians and Babylon and the Persians, and then finally Rome. But something else is going on in the midst of all of this. 
over the generations and the generations in that suffering, in exile, this little group of people found that they could still be faithful to God in the midst of their suffering, that the suffering didn't mean that it was over, didn't mean the story was done or shipwrecked in some way. And then this man, Jesus, is actually the central part of that continuing story. It was not over. So the stranger speaks up. And Jesus says, in essence, he's saying, what if this man's suffering actually confirms his identity instead of disproving it like the world thinks? What if the crucifixion is not Rome's defeat of Jesus, but God's defeat of evil and sin and guilt? And then in verse 26, he explained to them what was said, again, in all the scriptures concerning himself, because it's all one big story. Well, they keep walking. They keep, remember, they're walking the road to Emmaus. They keep walking down this road, and they get to the end of the road, and they say to the stranger, sir, the, the day is just about done. Would you come home with us? Would you come and eat with us? And it happened when he broke the bread. Maybe they saw the scars on those nail-pierced hands. And in verse 31, it says, Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Again, how great would that have been to be there as Jesus opens the scriptures to you? Because they began to see it right then. They saw the whole story, not just of pain, but more than that. They saw it's not just that in Jesus God suffers. No, it's also that in Jesus God triumphs. In Jesus, God has triumphed over our sin and over our guilt and over our failure and over our regret and even, yes, over our death. So for you, whatever road you may be walking down, whatever darkness you're facing, whatever regret you might be carrying around for far too long, defeat does not get the last word. Defeat does not get the last word. Sin and death don't get the last word. Because this same Jesus who was crucified by Rome did not behave like a dead man. He didn't stay crucified. He was raised up in the greatest act of power in human history. And when he was raised up, every hope of every human heart was raised up with him. For Jesus is not dead, but he is very much alive. And that's what they realized in that moment. That's how their eyes were opened. Now, Luke, the writer, is telling a story here, and it's a story that will change your story if you let it. Because if you remember, if you were with us then, all the way back to the beginning of one story, there was a couple, wasn't there? There was a, a couple by the name of Adam and Eve, and somehow the whole story of sin gets folded into their story. Because one day, one day they defied God. They decided to live in rejection of God and do what they wanted, and they did this the way that they expressed this was by eating that fruit that was forbidden to them. And there's a real interesting phrase way back in Genesis. It says that when they ate the fruit, their eyes were what? Opened. Their eyes were opened. Now that was a horrible opening because now their eyes are open to the possibility of sin and darkness and greed and evil and death and hatred and oppression. Now they could see that's what they wanted. And then from there, they went into exile. They had to leave the garden. Remember that? They, had, they were sent off into exile, into life away from God. And this really is a part of our story. It's part of the human condition ever since. Generation after generation, century after century. It is the human condition until one day, till one day, when a stranger came and lived among us. And this other couple now, this other couple walking down the Emmaus Road, receives food that came from the hands of the crucified son, son of God, and exactly the same phrase gets used here. And their eyes were opened. Now they could see the suffering love of God and the hope of a risen Savior. And in verse 33, it says, they got so excited, Luke says it this way, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Anybody know how far away Jerusalem was? Seven miles. So think about what they've been through that weekend. They watched their friend, their hopes get crucified. 
all the angst and agony that went along with that. Imagine how exhausted they were. No sleep the night before. Then this long, dramatic encounter with Jesus. And then a 14-mile marathon all in the same day. But they can't help themselves. They have a story to tell now, and they're going to tell it. And they do. So let's just leave them for a moment in Jerusalem to tell their story, because I want to ask just a little bit about yours, about your story. I don't know how it's going for you right now. I know some, I don't know all. I know if you live long enough, you're going to get disappointed, and you will suffer in ways that you did not see coming. And that will confuse you. And it will make you wonder things like, where is God? Where's God now? Why am I going through this? Whose story am I living? I've been hoping, but I've been hurt. I get so anxious. I feel so alone. I failed again. You know, everybody has to choose what story they're going to live by. And our world will give you one if you're not careful. They'll, they have a story to tell you, and they're going to impose it upon you. Because if a lot of, there's a lot of people in our world that will tell you stuff like this. You know, just... Just go with the success story. Just be successful. It's, it's about what people have always said it's about. Wealth and power and prestige. That's what it's all about. Now the problem with that is, if you live that long enough, eventually you will die and they will bury your attractive and successful and wealthy corpse in the ground. And what do you do then? And a lot of other people in the world will tell you, there is no big story. There is no real meaning. Anybody who tries to tell you there's real meaning is just blowing smoke. It all means nothing. You're alive a little bit and then you're gone. Plenty of people think like that and they live their lives without meaning or hope. But for 2,000 years now, there's been this other story. Jesus has been taking the unlikeliest little stories and folding them into his story. I remember hearing about a woman by the name of Pam who was really, really confused about the whole God thing growing up. One of her parents was Catholic and the other was Jewish. And so one of the parents would take her to synagogue and when she'd come home, the other parent would make her say a rosary to repent and ask forgiveness for going to synagogue. And so she was, it was all very, very weird to her and so she wanted nothing to do with God. And her home life was kind of a mess. She started drinking really early on in life and she was married and divorced five times by the time she was 35 years old. She finally got so desperate that she joined AA, but as a lot of you know, when you join AA, you're supposed to turn over your life and your will to a higher power. But she didn't want anything to do with God. So this was her solution. She said, okay, I'll do it, but I'll choose my own higher, higher power. And I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna name my higher power Ralph. So she turned her life and her will over to Ralph, and so far, it wasn't working out too well. And one night, she was at an AA meeting, and a guy came in as bad a shape as she'd ever seen. He was, looked terrible. He smelled terrible. He was obviously still drinking. And he got up and he said, hi, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Ralph. And she just immediately in her head said, that is not my God. And in a way for her, her eyes were opened. And she was on her own road to Emmaus at that point in time. She didn't know it at the time, but she was. And then soon a friend comes alongside of her, just the way Jesus did with the two that were on the Emmaus Road. And this person that came alongside her was a Jesus follower. And that friend said to her, I know who can give you a different story. And he can make your ending come out a whole lot better than where it's headed right now. And she said yes. And her entire story changed from that day on. And for 2,000 years, Jesus has been doing this. And he'll do it for you. Again, I don't know what your story is. I don't know the fullness of it. I do know that if you live it long enough, you're going you're gonna to take some hits. You're going to be disappointed. You'll go through some rough times. You'll question. And you'll do, have to do some things that you don't want to do. But here's the truth, friends. You are not here by accident. You're not. You are made and loved by a God who cares about you more than you could possibly imagine. And your story gets messed up because our world is messed up mostly because of this basic problem of sin. We turn away from God and we get it all wrong and we realize that we can't fix ourselves. So one day this Jesus comes along and he walks among us and he says things no one ever said, did things no one has ever done. And he went to a cross and it looked like any other death, looked like that was the end of the story. 
Turns out that when he was dying on that cross, he was actually not just dying his own death. He was dying for you, and he was dying for me. And thank God he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he was raised up again in victory over sin and pain and death. And your story can be a part of his story if you want it to be. So maybe you're here today and you've been carrying some hurts that you never thought you'd have to carry. Maybe there's some roads that you're walking down. You never saw yourself having to walk down these roads. And so today, this man comes to walk alongside of you and invite you into the life that he's, in, he's created for you, to walk in forgiveness and grace. He wants you to be a part of his love and grace that comes from him. And then one day you will be raised up for life with God forever, with God and with God's people. And if you want that to be a part of your story, you can do that. You just tell him now, as so many have done over the last 2,000 years that have been on every kind of road you can possibly imagine. You say, God, I, I want to walk down your road. I want you to be my rock, my forgiver. I understand that you are very much alive, and I want to live in your love and grace for the rest of my days. And friends, I made that decision a long, long time ago. And there are very, very few decisions that you make in life that, some, you know, that you don't question at some point in time. That one has never been questioned. Has it always been easy? No. I've never once regretted that decision that I made. To be a follower of Jesus through thick and thin because I get to live in the love and the grace of Almighty God and it is worth every bit along the way. All right, why don't you bow your heads and we'll pray. Well, again, Lord, we are grateful for your word to us, your story that comes alive, alive to us. And we recognize, Lord, that we're invited into your story to blend our stories. We don't want to live separately anymore. Why would we when we can live in the love and grace of God? So, Lord, I, I pray for all of my friends that are here in this room this morning, everyone who's listening to this. Lord, I pray that you give them the courage to just take a step forward and say, Lord, I want to receive what you died to give me. I don't want to let that great sacrifice, that great payment go to waste. I want to receive the invitation that you've given me to fold my life into yours and receive your grace, receive your forgiveness, receive your love, and walk in it from this day on. Thank you for your promise to make us new creatures, brand new creations where old things have passed away and everything has become new. Thank you, Lord, for the new life that we receive from you. Help us to walk in it this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.